Hello, hello. I'm hoping everything's working on my end. Uh, you know, be on the meet, guys, say hello. Drop it into the chat. G'day. Hey, there we go. All right, thank you very much. We got one person at least. <laughs> cool. All right, we uh, uh, we'll just give everyone thirty seconds to a minute to join, and we will get started. But I would love to know where are you watching or listening from? Uh, if you could uh, drop a little hello, uh, drop a little hello in the chat uh, with your location, that'd be pretty awesome. I'm uh, currently based on the Gold Coast in Australia, and uh, most of the team are down in Melbourne. But uh, some of our team work uh, work remotely and work from all over. Okay, so uh, support scissor from Perth, uh, Tuan from Melbourne, welcome. Uh, Stephen from or uh, Stefan from Brisbane, Sam from Melbourne, Beth in Forbes, Audrey in Melbourne, Jean in Melbourne. So many Melbourne people. It must be bloody cold down there right now. <laughs> uh, it was it was uh, it was eight degrees this morning on the Gold Coast, and I thought that was pretty cold. So it must be cold. It must be cold down there. Uh, hello from Noosa. Welcome, Carolyn. Ray in Melbourne. Uh, Matthias in Sydney, my hometown. Uh, Kitty in Melbourne. Fiona in Melbourne. Uh, Ray, sun is out. Yeah, the sun's out here too, but it's still a little bit chilly. Um, uh, Hadar in Melbourne. Isabel, Tampa, Florida. Fantastic. Awesome. Welcome, welcome. Uh, we've got we've got customers all over the world. We have we have customers in about. 15 or 20 different countries now, which is uh, which is pretty crazy. Uh, that's across our group. Um, so welcome, thank you so much for joining. We are based in Little Australia, this uh, this little island down here. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, we're uh, we're reaching out all over, thanks to our our YouTube channels. Uh, mostly international audience now, which is pretty crazy. Less than 20% of our total watches are from Australia. So uh, we're truly now becoming a global business, which comes with all of its fun challenges. Uh, Borbo IT, g'day from Gippsland. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, so before we start, if you're just joining, um, thanks so much for coming in. We'd love to know where you're watching from. Uh, but for those of you who've been with us for, uh, for a couple of minutes uh, already here, I'd love to know what comes to mind when you think of the word fort? F-O-R-T, what comes to mind when you think of that word? Because that's a word we use often internally here. Um, it's all about how do we secure businesses, how do we secure platforms? But I'd love to know what, what comes to mind for you when you hear that word for? Maybe just drop that down uh, in the chat. So we've got defense, safe, secure, security. Excellent. And I'm curious, do you do you immediately think of IT, or uh, or do you think uh, or do you think more of the uh, of the the defence uh, the defence side of things? Because I really like that word. Um, to me, building something with the kids, I love that. <laughs> uh, welcome, Ben. Um, Pualo, uh these days I think IT. Yeah, very cool. Castle. I think castle as well. I think of like turrets. I think of like turrets and stuff on castle. Um, but to me, uh, you know, and I start thinking about moats, moats and stuff as well. Um, to me, when I think about that and, and how it does relate to IT is, is really about um, if you've got your defenses right, then everything you get to do inside the fort, you get to have innovation, you get to have collaboration, and your team get to thrive in the way that they um, to me, what that to me what that then means is if the outside is protected, it allows the inside to be innovative and the inside to be productive as well. Um, because when we're talking about security, and this um, this presentation is all about security, um, when we're talking about it, it's it's pretty easy for security to actually impede innovation and for security to slow down productivity as well. Um, and it's one of the things that I think is fantastic about the Google ecosystem is so much of it is 
um, positioned for productivity, positioned for collaboration, positioned for integration. And that's one of its real strengths. Um, but what it also does um, you know, really well is it actually protects as well. Uh, and Google have got an excellent reputation for security and protection. Um, so now that we've waited a couple of minutes, uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's get started. So um, I think we've got Stan on slides. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be introducing our presenters today, uh, Adrian Cosman Jones, founder of Onsite Helper, uh, and um, you know has been um, in this industry for over 20 years now. Stan, similar pedigree in the IT industry. Uh, here's our head of sales, um, Stan Stankovic. Thank you so much for uh, for co-presenting, guys. Uh, they are. Uh, they have a fantastic presentation here for you, um, Stan. We might uh, flick through to the next slide, um, if you don't mind, and uh, and we will get started. Uh, for anyone who's come late, they may have to just catch the replay, uh, unless I can control the slides. Am I able to control the slides? I don't know. Or maybe I'll. How about I present for the first couple, and then I'll let you, and I'll let you guys do the rest. Let me do that now. I'm going to share here. All right, and let's present. Wonderful. Um, so thanks so much for joining. Um, my name is Pete Moriarty. Um, I'm the founder of a company called IT Genius. Um, IT Genius and Onsite Helper um, have now effectively become partner businesses um, with shared ownership. Um, and we've uh, collectively between us built um, the number one Google Cloud partner for small businesses across Australia and New Zealand, uh, maybe even to be the world at some stage. We'll see how we go. Uh, but we're um, really the two firms that have been absolutely obsessed for over a decade now um, in servicing and supporting Google Workspace, uh, where most of the IT industry focuses on the Microsoft stack or Microsoft with a small amount of Google. Uh, we are two Google first companies um, who are working together to uh, you know support both um, small businesses and micro businesses within the IT Genius brand um, and with on-site helper, mid-market and small corporate businesses. Um, and so we've worked with um, many of Australia's leading brands across both of the companies uh, and uh, delivered successful projects over uh, more than a decade, thousands of projects across thousands of customers. And collectively, I think we have around 25,000 endpoints um, under management. Um, so we're both uh, scaled up. Um, and in today's presentation, I want to encourage you to uh, raise your hand uh, if you have any questions. Um, or you'd like to add any comments, you can use the uh, chat box. Uh, the guys will be monitoring those as we go along. Uh, you can also use the Q&A feature. So there'll be a Q&A section at the end where the guys will answer any questions that you have. Um, and of course, uh, make notes. Uh, if you can you know, put your phone down and try and keep as present as possible in the presentation, then you're going to get a lot more value out of it. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand over to, uh, I'm not sure if Adrian or Stan is going to jump in first, uh, but I'm going to hand over and let these guys take it from here. So whoever would like to take over the screen sharing, I will now hand over to you. And I've got you guys on mute at the moment. Okay. Uh, oh, Adrian, you are coming through slowly. I don't know if everyone else has you yet. Um, Hello? All right. Yep, I, I can hear you now, Adrian. You're a I little can hear you, Adrian. All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks for, the... for some reason a bit flaky in the office today. Uh, I might have to connect to my hotspot. Yeah, uh, I think I think Adrian, you might want to go to a backup. Um, Stan, do you maybe want to take uh, take over for this slide because we've got we've got quite a large delay on you, Adrian. Cool. Yeah. Do you want to just open one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, how the IT company has internet issues, right? <laughs> Always. <laughs> oh, Adrian is now Stan and Stan is Adrian. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. You wait. It it might it might also be the noise cancelling. So um, uh, maybe just check the volume on your end. But I'll I'll let you take it away, Adrian. No worries. Thanks for the introduction again. Uh,
Uh, Pete? I was um, audio issues. Yes, that's the same. I think anyone else is uh, going to have the same sorry. problem. Uh, I think maybe go to your backup internet connection, guys. All right, wonderful. While we're uh, while we're waiting for those guys, um, I'd love to know if you uh, on the call live. Um, what's your awareness of Essential Eight? Uh, uh, the framework right now? at the moment. Is this the first time that you've heard of it? Uh, have you already started um, implementing or um, using the framework internally? Um, just drop down in the comments and let us know. Uh, you started working with Essential 8 yet? Yeah, cool. Gonna mute this for a second while we wait. Ben, uh, we sell cyber insurance and we are very well aware of it. Excellent, thanks Ben. Um, personally, my own experience is that um, I started getting, I guess, real serious about security when we started working with a number of clients in the new medical and allied health industry uh, and we started implementing or using the Australian privacy principles as a guide for security uh, and as a guide for locking down Google Workspace um, and uh, Essential 8 um, to me was uh, actually fairly new um, security is more the uh, on-site um, you know uh, security frameworks and compliance are more the uh, side of on-site helper um, that handle um, more sophisticated security implementations than IT Genius do. For IT Genius, it's usually just flicking on a couple of the policies like password policies and two-factor authentication workspace, um, whereas we actually have a team inside OnSite Helper um, where we've employed um, white hat hackers um, and uh, we actually have a number of compliance protocols around security that we implement for customers, given that mid-market and corporates have a lot more needs in that area. Uh, so some other comments here from Paolo, uh, similar requirements sent to us by Institute of Public Accountants, E8 is baseline for all our clients, for bore IT, YK Bookkeeping, review the framework, and I'm having to think about how it applies to my business. Cool. All right. I'm, I'm hearing you loud and clear, so I think we can hand over to you if you guys are good to go. Awesome. Thanks for that. Sorry about <laughs> technical difficulties. Uh, yeah. So um, as I was saying, the, uh, the agenda for today is all about Essential 8 and Google Workspace. And we're going to start off with some overview and stats about the landscape. We're going to talk about compliance, what it's all about. And then we're going to dive into the Essential 8. Uh, we've got a checklist, which is very useful, which is a takeaway you guys can, can use to implement yourself or have us help you out with. And then we'll have some action and summary at the end. So. A little bit about, I guess, we've got this uh, particular art, uh, article here uh, about what's happening in the landscape. So here we've got a, a small business owner in South Australia. Uh, he warns about others to prioritise password management after experiencing an email uh, hack uh, and attempted scam. And from that, it actually, the article actually talks about nearly 44%, or well, nearly half, uh, which is 44% of uh, Australian small businesses have suffered a cyber attack, uh, according to a recent survey. And with that, small businesses are urged to enhance their cybersecurity measures, including using strong passwords, implementing multi-factor uh, security, and avoiding using password sharing. So a lack of time and resources often hinder small businesses from prioritizing cybersecurity, making them vulnerable to potential business uh, ending incidents, and small business owner, owners are encouraged to seek training and practical tips to enhance their cyber uh, awareness protection. So the next uh, article is about, uh, we're all aware of uh, the Optus hack, which happened uh, a year or two ago, um, and what the impacts of that were. So just a reminder, you know, the Optus particular data breach, um, you know, that affected some 10 million customers. Personal information such as names, dates of birth, phone numbers, email addresses was all were all compromised. Um, so if it can happen to these big guys, small businesses are also warned about breaches impacting and the need for security, uh, cyber security. Uh, business email uh, compromise is a significant concern. 
with potential financial losses. And over 60% of small business owners may reuse compromised passwords across critical systems. So they might not even be aware about it, but they're still using those compromised passwords, which is a big concern. So strong security measures and unique passwords are vital for small business, small and medium-sized businesses to protect uh, against breaches. Uh, the next slide we're talking about the uh, here we've got the breach impact factors, and here we've got um, sort of positive means for reduction of uh, breach costs through controls, and also negative ones uh, that increase breach costs due to specific factors uh, that are being listed. So yeah, those dark blue uh, items all are all about. If you implement these controls, then you're reducing um, the cost of a data breach. And obviously, the the lower end of that table with with the other blue colour, um, yeah. If you if you if you have these in place and and there's data breach, and it's going to significantly increase uh, the cost of your data breach. So, a couple to highlight. Um, we can see uh, employee training. So enhancing. Minimising response from one of these incidents, uh, that's going to significantly reduce, reduce that cost. Uh, security analytics providing uh, proactively detecting and responding to threats. Uh, you know, one of our favourite multi-factor authentications. Obviously, that's going to reduce uh, the cost as well. Um, an extensive use of data loss uh, prevention uh, protects sensitive data from you know getting sent out externally. And interesting enough, managed service, managed services, uh, managed security services, which a lot of managed service providers do, you know, that's going to significantly reduce it. But that's towards the lower end of the whole scale. So there's many other things uh, you should be doing. So you don't always have, you shouldn't always just rely on your managed service provider to provide all all your security concerns, because obviously that's not as high as some of these other things and that you might be missing out on, on some of these really important aspects. Next slide, we want to talk about uh, breach cost savings. So here we can see that there are tremendous cost savings if your business, uh, if you're in business that has correct resource to, to handle security requirements or have competent third parties doing this for you. So although IT security is costly to implement and maintain, having an IT security incident is far more expensive on average and the cost savings by having the correct IT resources around 800,000 uh, Australian. So with this uh, pie graph, we can see that only about 38% of organisations reported having sufficiently staffed um, security teams and on the other side of that scale, this, the other 60% of organisations obviously had um, security teams where, which were understaffed um, and organiz organizations uh, with a skill shortage in their security teams experienced higher than average costs for data breaches and on average organizations with suf uh, sufficient staff security teams had a lower cost of obviously uh, for data breaches on the other end of that and the costs um, for data breaches for sufficiently staffed organisations was around $8 million um, for that one. So, yeah, as I mentioned, the average cost for a data breach for non-compliant organisations worldwide uh, is around $8 million per, per data breach, which is a very significant amount. Um, so this is for non-compliant organisations, um, so meaning they don't have compliance in place um, to combat you know, these, these fibre incidents. So it's a very significant number. So, and with that, uh, a lot of attacks happen from social engineering. So social engineering is often when cyber criminals will do some research uh, about, you know, they're quite targeted attacks. So they might research your particular organisation, look, look up your website, look up LinkedIn, uh, find out about you know who 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 are in the business, and they might do sophisticated attack like 
you know, creating a, a dummy email from the CEO to someone lower in the business and, and requesting, you know, login credentials for a certain application. Um, and, and, you know, obviously once those credentials are sent to, to that email address, which mimics the CEOs, but could, could be slightly different, um, and it ends up going to that cyber criminal and they can then have a data breach and access your information. They often often do this also for, for payments. They might be sending this, you know, the CMO, CEO might send it to the accounts manager to, to pay a particular invoice. Um, and obviously that's fraudulent and, and then you've got an incident there. So we see this quite quite often in the in social engineering attacks. So some more facts on security incidents. 70%, 76% of respondents uh, in a 2022 case study covered in the US, Canada, Australia, uh, say that they experienced at least one cyber attack this year. Uh, this is a large increase um, from 2022, 55% increase, which is which is huge. Um, from the same study, only 30% of, of cyber uh, had cyber insurance, um, and 69% were fearful that uh, that a successful cyber attack could put their small, medium-sized business out of business entirely. Um, and from that. Uh, compliance failures, the average cost of a breach was 70% higher. So, uh, again, it goes to show the importance of compliance because it's very costly if you do have a breach. Um, it's going to be significantly, uh, significantly a lot more expensive. Some more information here. Uh, in Australia, large-scale uh, data breaches can result in fines of up to $50 million dollars or three times um, the benefit or 30% adjusted turnover. Organisations spend $8 million on compliance, while non-compliance costs on an average of $22 million. Uh, and some stats from around the world, the GDPR, which is the European sort of compliancy uh, organisation, imposes strict penalties with fines of up to 20 million or 4% of the turnover for non-compliance. Uh, so regular monitoring can save businesses on average of over a million dollars, while non-compliance events results in average revenue loss of 4 million. And some, uh, some information around um, our particular region. Here we can see uh, the percentage um, is a is the total disclosed events uh, per total incidents that were reported. Uh, even though comparing to other regions, less uh, incidents were reported, a high percentage of uh, data disclosure is still quite alarming. Um, so you can see 24% uh, for, for data security incidents uh, of that or well, 699 incidents, uh, 164 were confirmed with, with uh, data disclosure, which is 24%. Um, and it's quite interesting to see, you know, in the APAC region, social engineering, um, system intrusion, basic web application attacks, you know, th these were very high. And the, and the top actors were external by far. Um, and the, the main motive is by financial gain um, and the data compromise was mostly internal as well. Um, so there's quite some interesting statistics there. And finally, for the uh, just to reiterate that in Australia here, um, yeah, if you do have a data breach and it has isn't handled well, then you can be fined um, up to 50 million. Originally, when they brought in this particular act, it was only 2.2 million, but since the Optus and other significant large data breaches, um, they're really wanting to find, you know, the larger businesses as well, um, which, you know, 50 million is quite significant, or it could be three times um, the benefit obtained uh, from the mis misuse of data. Uh, the increase in penalties is part of upcoming le legislation to be introduced. Uh, actually, that, that's like that. Statistics fold. Um, next slide. Here we've got um, a list of 
so whenever there's a data breach, um, basically you get put on this particular website. Um, and this can be handy, you know, if you're wanting to find a particular supplier. Um, you can do your research and see if they've had a particular data breach as well. It shows the incident, who it was, um, and what, what data was compromised. So um, basically, in, in from this list, which is Australian, there's been 359 total data breaches to date since we've started uh, monitoring this stuff. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, you don't want to have your business on this list because um, it's not going to disappear. It's going to be quite detrimental, um, you know, for your reputation. Um, so very important to, uh, to focus on security and not get on this list. So this takes us to compliance. So compliance is, you know, why do we need compliance? Um, Compliance ensures we adhere to laws, regulations, and industry standards. So non-compliance can result in financial penalties, legal actions, and damage to reputation. Compliance mitigates risk like data breaches, cyber attacks, and fraud. And meeting compliance expectations enhances customers' trust, provides a competitive advantage. Um, and another important thing with compliance is it just stops, I guess, IT people winging it and just putting in their own security they, they feel that is needed. Um, this actually, they get to follow a proper standard and, and make sure things are done correctly. So when it comes to compliance with Google Workspace, uh, so as we all know, Google Workspace offers security, productivity, and, and a, as a collaboration tool. Uh, it prioritizes security through encryption, uh, authentication, and threat detection. Compliance with data protection regulates its support for essential eight controls. Admin controls enable users, user management and incident response. Uh, and collaboration features ensure secure sharing and real-time security. Uh, user education and best practice maintain a secure environment. So then we talk about the essential eight, which is uh, our preferred compliance here in Australia. So the Australian Cyber Security Centre has developed the essential eight to mitigate strategies in the form um, of the strategies to mitigation cyber security incidents to help organisations protect themselves against various cyber threats. The most effective of these mitigation strategies are the essential eight. So here we've got basically these eight levels of security, um, which uh, which I'll go into some detail here next. So the essential eight actually comes in three different maturity levels. They're called maturity levels. Um, so when implementing essential eight, you can start from level one, work your way to level two, level three, see how you f see fit, or you could go straight for level three if, if you want, which is the highest level. And this particular webinar uh, or training, uh, we're going to be focusing on, on level three, which is the highest. Um, and you can choose to you know, tone it down to the other levels, which we'll go into detail. But in our opinion, if you're going to be following compliance and setting up security, you might as well put in extra effort and, and do it to the, to the best ability to give your, your organisation the best chance of, um, of, of not having a, a cyber incident. So here we've got um, how the Essential 8 compares to Google Workspace plans. Uh, so it's a bit hard to read here, but we've, we've broken this table up into the different plans of that Google Workspace offer. And from that, each plan has different features um, that's available. Um, and then on the left here, we've got the Essential 8, uh, which is your know, application control, your patch, patching of applications and so forth, and which one of those plans um, are here to, well, what, what, what features are here to, for which, which plan. So in conclusion, if you wanted to go for the highest level, then you'd need to get the, um, the Enterprise Plus uh, version of Google Workspace to, to be compatible with uh, Essential 8 Level 3. 
So from that, we've got actually we've we've conducted a checklist. So we've we've put all those different features of Google Workspace, um, as well as the uh, the different essential eight requirements, and we've created a checklist which we'll share with you guys via email at the end. But here's a bit of an overview snapshot of the checklist. So the first essential eight um, requirement is patch management. So using endpoint management, which is a feature in Google Workspace to manage um, updates uh, for Chrome using Chrome OS browser. Um, and you can also do that for your other operating system. Um, so you, you may want to consider using a mobile device management solution for centralized um, update management. Uh, and you want to review and test updates before deploy deployment for compatibility. Um, and ensure reporting on device compliance, including patch status. So the next one of the essential eight um, is the application hardening and macros. So here you want to configure web browser settings to block pop-ups pop um, and limit tracking technologies. Um, you want to configure uh, application settings to enhance security. You also want to educate employees on uh, uh, secure software usage, and you want to enable features like sandboxing app, um, an extensive extensive uh, extension restriction for added security. So, sandboxing app is a uh, is one of those features in uh, in one of the enterprise SKUs, um, and with that, basically it uh, it enables you to open up emails and documents in a in a safe environment. And then if there is any malicious code, um, Google will see what it's doing. And if it is malicious, it will stop. It'll basically, you know, prevent you from opening up because it's opened up in that sandbox environment and it won't infect your computer. So it's a really good feature um, to prevent malware and other sophisticated um, attacks on, on a machine. So next one of the essential eight is Restrict uh, administrative privileges and, and also logging. So you want to create like, it's called a least privilege model. So grant administrative access only to those who need it. So we often find a lot of organizations make the mistake of applying super admin to many users. Um, this is way too much um, access. So you really want to go through your user list and only have one super admin ideally, and then have different admin levels for you know who needs what because the more access you give people the more you're opening up uh, your vulnerabilities to organization so monitor and review access regularly audit uh, and assess uh, administrative access so don't just set up up once and forget about it you want you want to reg regularly audit that everyone has the right permissions um, and ensure appropriate access to also files and folders, and make sure that there's some type of logging and monitoring um, in place. And Google Workspace does have logging. So if people are promoted to certain uh, permissions that, you know, you can do an audit and see who got promoted when um, and whether that's correct or not. So this, this is important that this stuff's in place. Next one on the checklist is uh, good old multi-factor authentication. You know, this is, um, and, and regular backups. So rather than enabling multi-factor authentication for sp specific users, there's a feature in Google Workspace where you can enforce it and you really want to choose this option. Um, you don't want people to choose whether they want to do MFA. You want to enable this option, put a date, and then it gets rolled out to everyone. So you, you, you can rest rest assured that your whole organization will have MFA enabled. Um, and it's it's one of the highest levels of security, you know, simplest things to do, best bang for buck when it comes to security um, is enabling MFA. You also want to choose uh, a compatible MFA solution. Um, so just, you know, a particular one is, you know, you, you might want to prevent, let's say, receiving SMS message for MFA authentication, because we've seen in the past um, some cyber criminals have redirected someone's mobile phone to their own phone um, overseas. So they actually received that SMS MFA code once they had the password and other things 
Um, so that made that MFA sort of insecure, whereas if you use a Google Authenticator app, and you know, that's particular, that's on your device, um, and it's a far more secure mode than, um, than using SMS. You want to regularly review and update your MFA policies, um, and you want to make sure that you've got regular backups um, of your Google Workspace and the data is protected. So Google Workspace don't really have a proper backup solution. Uh, people think that Google Vault um, is a backup, but it's not actually designed as a backup solution. Sure, it can create a copy of your data, but retrieving that data from Google Vault, if you wanted to do it in large volumes, is is uh, is not not ideal. So, we recommend a number of um, third party backup solutions that can back up the whole organization, um, all their Google Workspace data, and it's it's it's, it's very important to have. So that's the uh, essential eight checklist um, on a high level. Um, so action and summary. So when you're wanting to implement essential eight, uh, I guess you need a bit of a framework here. So initially you want to have a meeting for, you know, to initially audit uh, for the essential eight controls. Um, second, you, you'll need to obtain access. So you'll need someone to provide the correct level of uh, access to be able to to, to do the, the audit in the administrative panel. Um, third, you know, you do the initial audit, uh, obviously, to, to evaluate compliance. Next, you want to prepare a comprehensive audit report with recommendations. Uh, from there, you share the, the report uh, and obtain feedback. Uh, and finally, you want to discuss the full audits, uh, oh, sorry, you want to discuss the full audits of, of all the other um, items that you need to do next. So this can be the all your Windows devices, your Mac, third-party apps, uh, which will lead to uh, implementing and monitoring. So this was just the Google Workspace component. Uh, next one, we've got steps for a full audit and implementation. So as I mentioned, um, you know, we're focusing on Google Workspace and Essential 8. This is only, you know, one component of the essential eight, you still need to um, look for all the other items of your IT infrastructure. So again, it's a similar type of uh, audit process, but in this case, um, you know, you, you you need to focus more on on on, the, on every node, um, all the third party software to value compliance. Um, go from there. So the essential eight checklist, so this will get you to a baseline. Um, and again, just to reiterate, you've got your applic application control, which will control uh, over which Chrome apps um, and extensions can be used for logging of events, uh, patching of application, uh, automatic updates and removal of unsupported apps and extensions in Google Chrome, configure Microsoft Office macro settings, so potentially Risky scripts, which are macros in Google Docs, are disabled and sheets uh, with tracking of changes uh, and access. Uh, user application hardening, so blocking web web ads and enhancing browser security settings controlled by admins. Restrict admin privileges, control over app extensions usage, um, secure leveraging of important activities accessible only to admins. Patching operating systems, so you need to set systems to update, to keep, to be updated and secure. Lots of authentication we talked about um, in depth. So, and you also need to make sure that secure logging um, is also monitored. And obviously regular backups, so backing up your entire Google workspace. So this will create the baseline um, you know, the foundation of your essential eight um, with Google Workspace. So additional audits and monitoring uh, for audit compliance. So apart from the Google Workspace component, um, here we've identified all the other IT things which you may need to be auditing as well to get to essential eight. Um, so it pays a a critical role in, in assessing the organization's current security risks and identifying areas of improvement. 
to main, maintain compliance uh, well, compliance and effectively safeguard against uh, prevalent vulnerabilities in different systems, ongoing, ongoing audits uh, and monitoring are necessary. Uh, and a comprehensive audit and implementation process should be pursued to ensure, ensure the organisation adopts industry best practice and remains secure. Um, so the, yeah, they're all the different components which you need to be aware of. So we've got the, as I mentioned, we've got an essentially uh, security checklist, uh, which we've gone over, but with the, with the eight controls from the essential eight framework, it becomes easier to, can, to categorize and implement each control uh, according to specific needs. The systematic approach allows for more organized and, and targeted implementation of each control in ensuring comprehensive security coverage. By breaking down the controls into distinct, distinct categories, companies can prioritize and focus uh, on the areas that require immediate attention, uh, enhancing overall security effectiveness. Uh, and adopting the Essential 8 framework is highly recommended for small, medium sized companies. The framework provides a comprehensive uh, approach to enhance security and establish a strong foundation. And it also helps mitigate common risks and vulnerability. So we've actually got a, a particular offer. Um, so as I mentioned, we, uh, you know, to, to get to essentially, um, it, there's a number of stages um, and we've focused on compliance for level three. Uh, so following this presentation, we'll provide you uh, with the recording as well as a Google Workspace Essential 8 checklist, which will cover all the Google Workspace and Essential 8 things you need to be aware of. So you can, as I mentioned, you can order this yourself. You can pass this on to your IT team um, to complete. Um, however, if you'd like us to perform the order for you, uh, we've got a special for today, which is uh, four ninety seven. We usually charge about three thousand dollars for this particular audit. So the process is: you provide us with your Google account uh, with the correct privileges to do the audit. Um, our security team will then log into your Google Workspace admin console and complete the checklist and provide you with report for items that may need to be amended to meet the essential aid compliance. You can then implement these fixes yourself, or again, we, you could use a, a team like us to help you implement uh, these fixes. Um, you would also need to audit, as I mentioned, you also need to audit the other components of your IT environment, uh, which is the, the second stage. Um, of your devices such as your Windows, your Macs, PCs, your servers. Um, and the third stage would be the uh, third party applications. So this could be like your accounting software or your line of business apps. Uh, fourth stage is implementing um, all of the changes and fixes required. And, and last of all, the fifth component is to conduct regular reviews and this should be every three to six months or some businesses may want to do do this annually. So that's a little bit about um, how you go to implement uh, the essential aid. Uh, so just a little bit about us. We've got a couple of testimonials here uh, from some of our clients for some great jobs well done. Um, and next we've got a, if you open this link up in your browser, uh, this is a particular page. We'll also email this out to everyone of our particular offer for helping them implement Essential 8. Um, and that's pretty much it. I ran through it pretty quickly. I know we only had an hour, but I wanted to leave plenty of time for um, some Q&A. So uh, I might pass on to, to Pete to open it up for some Q&A. Or we can go more in depth if anyone has any questions. Thanks, Adrian and Sam. We've got a couple of questions coming through. Uh, so we've got um, uh, one question that I've posted up in the Q&A uh, from Sam. If you want to maybe take that one, uh, Adrian. It's around controlling office macros. Mm. 
Yep, I'm just bringing it up now. So I'm just, uh, do you want to just read that one out to me, Pete? Just, uh, let's go. Yeah, sure thing. So the question is, uh, is it possible to control Office macros through Google Workspace? Um, no. So typically, you would uh, we recommend to you know move across to Google Workspace for your Microsoft Office requirements. So you'd be using Google Sheets um, docs instead, and when it's when it's a Google Sheet or a doc, then those macros won't run. But if you're continuing to use Microsoft Office files in Google Drive, um, then those macros can be executed because it just, you know, it can be downloaded to the local machine and run through Microsoft Excel. Um, and then that, that macro could run. So the short answer is um, there isn't a feature in Google Workspace to prevent uh, macros executing in Google Workspace. And so I, I presume then um, the best way of managing those would be through Active Directory. Uh, and you know, most customers we're working with will have a hybrid uh, hybrid environment of some sort. I assume that would then be managed from the Windows administration side of things or Azure management? Yep, that's correct. Yep. Yep. Or if you've got a managed service um, sort of application which controls your devices, you can also have policies in there to prevent macros from being executed. On uh, that might be a good one. Because I guess where, where, my, where my mind goes to is if you specifically want to lock that down but you're trying to do everything in the Google world, maybe you've rolled out uh, GCPW so you've got credentials managed for end user machines but you don't necessarily want to have to run out, you know, roll out Active Directory just for locking, you know, just for that one task of locking down macros. It sounds like there's some third party, uh, third party options of endpoint management that could install effectively a, a, you know, a policy on the local machines that are going to lock those down without having to go to the trouble of fully rolling out Active Directory right across the org. Yep, that's, that's correct. Excellent. Cool. Okay, um, we've got some questions coming through, like. What's the difference between like cloud concierge and on-site helper? Like, where's Stan from? Which company is he from? So um, I might just cover that uh, myself really quickly. So, IT Genius and on-site helper are separate companies. They're separate businesses. Uh, we have separate teams. We work very closely together. Um, I'm the primary shareholder of both, um, and um, effectively, they they now operate as you know brother or sister businesses together. Uh, but they are they are two separate and distinct teams, um, and so I mentioned this at the uh, at the start that IT Genius focuses on micro and small businesses. Uh, typically, once a business hits 20, 30, 40 employees, uh, and their needs start to change around security, compliance, um, and the kind of IT service they're looking to invest in, uh, that's when Onsite Helper comes in uh, and typically works from businesses from the. 20, 30 employees up to hundreds or even thousands of employees. Um, and so Onsite Helper um, is uh, our core business based down in Melbourne. Um, and uh, that's what most of the content here applies to is clients um, who are in the larger uh, larger business uh, segment. I hope that makes sense. Uh, Stan and Adrian are both um, part of Onsite Helper, um, so part of our Melbourne team, um, and specifically working a little bit more focused on security and uh, integration of Google Workspace with legacy systems like I mentioned Active Directory and more hybrid environments um, that larger businesses are typically managing. Uh, okay, we have Joff who has his hand raised. So uh, Joff, I might uh, invite you to unmute and uh, ask your question directly and then Stan and Adrian, you guys can answer. Sure, thanks Pete. Um, the, my question relates around the macros. Uh, I work in the finance industry um, so we are sent loan calculators by the banks and they are they have macros now Microsoft automatically um, prevents uh, macros from running but we um, go into each file as we download it and and activate the macros is that sufficient 
safety in that measure in in that situation? Uh, the short answer is no. Like the the compliance is quite strict on a flat blanket of having macros disabled. Um, you know, like I, I guess the question is, you know, how are you to judge a safe macro versus a harmful macro? Unless you're very highly trained and you can, you know, investigate what that macro is actually doing, then if you're allowing some users to enable some macros from supposedly trusted sources, then you know you you are sort of enabling a particular vulnerability potentially into that business. So. The safe side is to to not have any macros to to blanket disable everything, as opposed to you know, enabling it as as, we, as initially. Um, but we can't do our job unless we enable those macros to um, do the calculations. So effectively, what it what what these um, spreadsheets do? They're all Excel spreadsheets. What they do is enable us to work out things like maximum borrowing capacity uh, and. Uh, those sort of things for for applications that are underway and we have to submit those loan calculation results with the loan application so we can't do our job unless they uh, unless we actually use those files that we've provided yeah yeah I guess one option could be you could have a, a virtual machine in like um, Google Cloud um, and you could send that particular macro to, to that virtual machine, which is isolated off your network, um, not connected to any of, any of your logins, and then you could execute that file in that, that, that virtual sort of environment. Um, so if, that, if there was a malicious macro, it wouldn't you know, infect your, your machine. It would only affect that virtual machine and not, not compromise anything. So... You'd have to sort of set up a secure environment to do that, but there there would be a workaround, um, and that would that would enable you to be compliant um, if you did have multiple sort of layers of security in place um, to safely enable a macro in a safe environment, which which isn't you know your your main your main computer you're working off. So there would be would be a workaround for that one. All right, thank you. Oops, so thanks, your question, and thank you for the uh, thank you for the response, Adrian. Uh, we've got another hand up. We'll go to that one uh, to Bobo IT. Okay, Don. You there, Don? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, unmute. That helps, doesn't it? So I'm not used to meat. You know, I'm a vegetarian. Uh, yeah, look, a partial solution for that issue with the uh, with the signs from the sorry with the documents sent from a bank was it uh, would yeah. be to ensure that those documents are digitally signed by that organisation so that you can you can have a level of trust uh, in in those documents if it's if it's essential to to run those macros. Yeah, yeah, I think that's 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 a good option for sure. Thanks, Don. Welcome. Okay, next question. Uh, we've got one from uh, Arpalo. Great question. Uh, for remote teams with bring their own device, uh, what are you recommending for endpoint protection? How do you handle that? Yeah, it's all, it's it's always difficult trying to implement. Um, this compliance, any type of compliance with the BYOD policy of bring your own device. Um, pretty much, if you want to do that, you have to really lock down that machine. So, um, you know, the user wouldn't be able to use it for really much personal use, which which is um, which could be quite frustrating. Um, like they won't be able to install different things on it because one of the biggest requirements of, of Essential Eight is removing administrative privileges. Um, so it is, it is quite challenging with BYOD devices to get Essential Eight unless you have all the security measures in place because you can't just you know skip one of them because then you wouldn't be compliant. Um, but the actual endpoint protection 
feature you know that that can be the same as your organization whatever you're using for your endpoint protection um there's not a particular one which will do uh you know byd of devices specifically better than you know devices in, in you know company owned devices um they all that that particular protection should be uniform across devices but yeah the main thing is having all that security in place on the BYD as well as a corporate device that it's really locked down and you've got no exceptions so that's why BYD is very BYD is very challenging um, to get essentially compliance another alternative is to give them a, a Chromebook where the essential eight becomes the essential four because there's all far less requirements of uh, uh, of security measures so and they're, and they're quite affordable too as well it's quite an affordable option I might also add there that um, like Chromebooks are quite affordable so distributing one um, you know might be an easier option than just even dealing with um, BYOD um, and also um, certainly acknowledging um yes you know if it's people's personal devices they're going to be uncomfortable with having endpoint management software security software anything on their on their individual devices um and so if you can't make compliance and you need to make compliance um that may that may need to drive some investment in in a different device um as i said thankfully chrome devices are, are pretty uh, pretty affordable these days Though on mobile devices, um, because you know it's a lot more expensive to issue a new mobile phone to every single person, um, both iOS and also Android have pretty decent uh, corporate wipe functionality. And what I mean by that is when you set up the mobile device management on each of those uh, devices, it, it really creates like separate uh, profile and separate um, data for the corporate data versus somebody's personal data. Uh, let's say a personal um, iOS device enrolls, you can certainly enforce them to have a passcode. You wouldn't want any company data on a phone that doesn't have a passcode, and some people don't have passcodes still somehow. Um, but uh, on an Android phone, you've got the whole, it used to be called Android for Work. I think it might have been renamed these days, but um, effectively it gives you a, a completely different set of apps, a different set of files, a different set of photos, um, all completely cornered off uh, in the operating system, which is very, very cool. So mobile devices do have uh, corporate uh, security management done very, very well uh, and completely manageable by the Google Workspace ecosystem. You just manage it all in the um, in the enterprise, in the admin portal, um, and that manages that quite well. So uh, some good options there for bringing your own device uh, endpoint management. All right, uh, we'll go back to questions here. Um, let me see. One from support says, where does the responsibility lie when using third-party platforms like CRM systems and project management software? And I guess broadly any any kind of SaaS software. Yeah, I guess you really need to investigate each one on an individual uh, cases, case-by-case -case basis. Um, so things like, you know, does that, platform has multi-factor authentication um, and if it does then you know you need to enforce that if you don't have it then it's not compliance so checking all the security functionality of each application and adhering as much as possible to the essential eight framework as you can um, you know there is some flexibility around the essential eight but at the end of the day if there's a if there's a, a required feature for that security option and you didn't have that enabled, but you could have had that enabled, then you're definitely marked as 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 not not compliant. So, um, and there's some other things you can do as well. There's there's some third party applications that can manage, um, you know, your sign on, like a single sign on, um, and then you can then enable MFA uh, across all those cloud applications. Um, some popular ones might be Okta or LastPass, where yeah, they, they can sort of manage all that sign-on credential for you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Uh, I'd like to finish on time here. Uh, we've got a couple of people who are dropping off. I'm sure they'll get access to the uh, recording. Uh, but I want to say a massive thank you, Adrian and Stan, for putting the presentation together uh, and for co-presenting and, uh, and sharing this. 
this is obviously an area to navigate uh, in your business. And so I want to invite you, uh, if you're an organization that has more than 20 employees, uh, then you qualify to work with Onsite Helper. Uh, I've dropped a link in, which I will drop down uh, in there as well. Uh, we have an offer which is highly discounted. Um, this is effectively a security audit for your business uh, with a specific, uh, uh, basically a specific intent on um, helping you to implement or to navigate the essential eight uh, uh, security protocols. Um, and so if you're interested in that, it's highly discounted. Uh, and so I'd strongly recommend that you jump on that. Um, it's actually quite an in-depth audit that we go through in your business. It's about 10 hours work. Uh, the team will actually go through the administrator panel um, and review all of your policies inside of Google Workspace. Um, and then they will basically produce a report for you on what we've found. And there's a little bit of collaboration in there as well. Um, and effectively, at the end of that process, uh, you get back from us an action plan on how to actually implement your compliance in the business. Um, and you can go ahead and implement that yourself. That's fine. We'll share with you the guides. We'll share with you, you know, what you need to do. If you've got the bandwidth to do that yourself, that's fantastic. If you'd like to engage us uh, for us to help you to do that, uh, we'd love to have you as a customer to support you through that. Or if you are already a customer, wonderful. Um, you know, we'd be happy to help you work through this. Um, and so whether you're a customer of IT Genius or Onsite Helper, it doesn't matter. You're very welcome to take us up on this offer. Um, if you just have questions about it, um, I assume, uh, team, that they can just send an email. Uh, maybe Adrian or Stan, you can just uh, drop in the email address there um, if anyone has questions um, that they can follow up. Uh, you will get uh, you will get a few emails um, in, uh, in follow-up uh, from attending as well with the recording. I'm sure you can just hit reply um, to any of those if you need to, or Stan's even given his direct email there if you'd like to reach out to Stan. Um, so thank you, uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, I do need to jump off now and uh, we will officially end things here, but there's one more question that's popped through from Carolyn. Um, I'm gonna let you guys cover that and, uh, and then we will wrap up, but thank you so much everybody for joining. And um, just a reminder that URL's there, um, highly discounted at the moment. I recommend you jump on that, at least to be able to tick the box and say that you've done an audit. Um, and I'm sure our team will be able to find something to improve how you're running things uh, right now when it comes to your security and your policy. Uh, so I'd recommend every person jumps onto that. Uh, and with that, I'll hand back to you guys to finish that last question from uh, Carolyn. Thanks, Peter, appreciate that. Uh, let's have a look at this question. Uh, so on a more sp uh, simplistic level, I'm a sole trader. To what degree do you feel that uh, internet security programs such as Bitdefender uh, which I have actually provide real time and effective security to personal devices. Yeah, so I guess um, you know AV antivirus, which is Bitdefender, is you know that's one of the the layers of security that's that's required. Um, so whether you use Bitdefender or the ones that are built in Windows, um, they all got their different sort of. Uh, pros and cons as you would with any product, but they're only one of the components um, of, of your security stack. So you really need to review all, you know, all your areas of security, all your vulnerabilities, and that's why a checklist is very important because on the checklist, you're going to have one of the items, which is your antivirus, and tick, I've got Bitdefender, um, so that I've ticked that item, but, uh, you know, we've our particular checklist has uh, 90 odd other things you need to be aware of. So not to say that they're all specific softwares that you need to have, but there are controls and other things you you, you will need to have. Um, so Bitdefender is a good start, but yeah, there's plenty more to do when it comes to security. Uh, we've got another one for Tito. Can I ask a non-webinar related question? Queries seems to be unavailable. Can so, okay, I'll... Um, I'll email you directly for that one, Tito. So that's that's not related to this webinar. Um, Stan's already addressed it. Cool. I think that's about it. So thanks everyone for coming. Uh, yeah, I hope you got some value. So keep an eye out for future emails coming from us because we will we'll be sending out the checklist for you to do it yourself, or we can help you as well. Uh, we'll also send through the recording so you can pass it to anyone else. Um, and hopefully, yeah, with this with with this information, you can uh, build your security posture to a very good level and 
stay secure. So I might wrap it up there. Thanks everyone and uh, have a great weekend. Bye.